I'm Justin Lum with Fox 10 News, and we have reached the one-year mark since the search for J.J. Vallo and Tylee Ryan went public out of Rexburg, Idaho. It was December 20th, 2019. And this case is really a web of multiple cases spanning multiple states, including Arizona and, of course, Idaho and Utah. And it took several months to really uncover the layers in such a tragic story. I have the honor today of holding this roundtable discussion with three journalists who have covered the Ballo Daybell case extensively since that day, December 20th, 2019. And really behind the scenes, it has bonded us together. We have Nate Eaton, news director and senior reporter for East Idaho News, Eric Grossarth, reporter for East Idaho News, and Adam Herbetz, investigative reporter for Fox 13 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Gentlemen, thank you guys for joining me. It has been a crazy year to say the least 2020 in itself and just uh thank you guys for being here thanks justin adam yeah, thanks. eric good to see you guys good to see everyone finally together yeah, it's, it's been a while and it's been quite yeah. a few months since the four of us have been able to be in the same room whether that's because of covid or because of the constraints of the story and travel but um yeah. definitely enjoyed meeting all three of you on this this crazy story i always say we meet the the nicest people under the crazy circumstances in this job so yeah so the, right. the, thanks to zoom thanks to zoom we can meet here and have this discussion and um just go back and forth so let's start where we were all last year at this time whether uh, it was in the newsroom or you're out in the field covering a story or maybe you were just home how did you find out about jj and tylee and of course their mother lori ballo anyone can jump in here and just give us uh your perspective nate and i were in the car driving through we were in rexburg right just leaving rexburg that afternoon when we got that first news release we were doing our secret santa program uh where we go and distribute some gifts for uh, uh someone that gives it out an anonymous person and we were out there and we get an email uh saying that these two kids were missing we were just driving on the car and it definitely seemed something a little more serious because I, I always say Rexburg's the kind of town where the police are involved when somebody doesn't get enough hot sauce packets at Taco Bell. Um, it's that's kind of the, the community it is. So when you get a news release like that, it's a little different than what normally happens there in that community. Um, and so we were just talking about it the whole seemed like most of that evening. Yeah, it was uh, it was a Friday, I remember, and Friday before Christmas when the news release went out. And I I started my uh, career here in television several years ago, and so a lot of the the police officers that I knew then are now in leadership roles now. And I had heard a few weeks before this, back in October of 2019, that something big was coming, uh, but I wasn't quite sure what that was. Is it like a big drug bust or something? And and everybody was being real quiet about it, which was a little unusual. And then when that news release went out, it was, I don't know, was it three or four pages? It was kind of long. And for a news release to come out of Rexburg, Idaho, like that, you knew there was something more. And then when I started to call around to different police sources, they're like, just, just wait, just, this is nothing. So, so you knew it was something a, a lot bigger than that. But I think we put up that news release and then we put up that they were a, a person of interest. I think you guys actually started the, kind of the original reporting on it, though, because uh, we went away for the holidays and it wasn't until East Idaho News really started to get dig into it. It wasn't until January and we had seen some of uh, Adam's and Justin's stories and we thought, oh, this this seems to be branching out further than just Rexburg. Yeah, I mean, I think you're selling yourself a little bit short there, Nate. I remember, so you guys ran your first story on December 20th, I want to say. That's the Friday you're talking about. And then we ran our first story for TV on December 21st. That was the, the next Saturday. And I was just, you know, filling in for somebody on a weekend shift, right? And um, I think I did two stories that day. I was covering like a stabbing in some weird part of town uh, and... Um, before I got dispatched to that breaking news event, somebody sent me a link to your guy's article, which obviously included the, the press release from the Rexburg Police Department. And right away, I mean, I don't think we quite knew the Arizona angles just yet, but there were obviously um, Idaho angles and, and the Utah angle. You know, there was a, a woman's body exhumed from a cemetery not far from where my TV station is. So 
we, we covered the breaking news and then we drove straight from there down to the cemetery down in Springville um, and just started making frantic calls on the way. And I think after maybe seven, eight, nine phone calls, I finally got Captain uh, uh, Hagen on the phone and just begged him to do like a five minute phoner. And, you know, he eventually agreed. I think that ended up being like the only interview he would end up doing for months and months and months, right? And, um, you know, for, for a story that's this complicated and, you know, it, it was complicated on day one, really, but it got even more complicated as months and months went by. I mean, we put that first story together in like two, three hours. And then mm -hmm. Justin, you could probably pick up the story from here. I think I called you the next day as we started looking at some of the Arizona angles. And I remember just, Justin, you, you, he, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on this, but I remember just feeling like a crazy person talking to you on the phone, mm -hmm. trying to explain all this to you. And, you know, it's the same reaction that my friends and family have trying to explain the story. They're like, wait, say that again? Like, who's, who's, who's Alex again? Wait, ba back me up. I mean, there's so many layers to this. And I remember just, you know, drawing stick figures on a napkin um, and, and tying all the webs together with all the people involved in this case. And, it's it's super tragic and it's, it's terrible that it takes something like this to draw all three of our communities together yeah i remember it was december 21st and i was covering multiple stories and i was in the newsroom and adam you mentioned you were filling in on a weekend i worked weekends then but we had a producer filling in uh her name is melissa and she kept bringing up this story she kept talking about these two missing kids out of idaho and their mom Lori vallow and then her new husband chad daybell but I kept asking again, well, how does this bring us back to Arizona? We get missing persons reports all the time. You guys know that in, in the news business. And then when she explained it, we had to put it up on a whiteboard because again, there's so many names involved. And the main thing that we could trace it back to was the July 11th, 2019 shooting of Charles Vallow. And basically realizing that, hey, this is an Arizona family. And, and these kids have only been in Idaho for a short time. And now we really know how much of a, the duration, how, how, how much they were, how long they were in Idaho. It wasn't very long, uh, sadly, but just re remembering that, that story, how complex it was. And we couldn't do it that same Saturday. And we did end up talking to uh, uh, Captain Hagen, I believe the next day on, on Sunday. Um, but it was just, we had to unpack it all and, and really dive into it. So Nate, I wanna follow up with you. you. You talk about these law enforcement sources that you have that you basically, grown with as you've uh, covered news in, in Rexburg and other areas in Idaho, but um, what nugget did you take away after that first week of coverage, after that, that the first week, everything, not everything, but, but another surface, like beneath it, than what we got in that press release where you said, okay, that, that stands out and there's so much more to this case. Well, that first night I was actually going, my kids were in a choir concert for the holidays. So I, w I went into this choir concert and and there were it was in Rexburg, ironically, and there were people in the community that were coming up to me. I was videotaping it just to stream it live for the choir. And uh, people were coming up before the show, like whispering, you see those missing kids? Chad Daybell, who I didn't know, is associated and his wife died in October. So I'm messaging Eric, who's at home. And so all during that sh show, he's doing, Eric's doing research at home. And we have another staff, Nate, staffer, Nate Sunderland, who's also in on the conversation. So by the time I left that choir show, you know, into two hours, they had kind of pieced together dead husband, dead wife. And I wasn't really following at all. I was like, wait, what? This sounds weird. Um, the other weird thing is that, you know, you guys know how this works when kids go missing you go and you talk to their neighbors or their friends, or you try to learn about these people and figure out who they are. Nobody knew them. Nobody knew in Rexburg, nobody knew Lori. Nobody knew JJ or Tylee. We later learned that he was enrolled at school for just a few days and that Tylee was here for a few days, but they didn't really know anyone, which was, was, which was also odd. You'd think somebody at church, somebody, somebody would know them, but nobody could speak to who these people were other than Chad and nobody in his community was talking. No, nobody wanted to talk about this. And, and so it, it, that added a, a bit of mysteriousness to the story. So I think Justin, after about a week, um, seeing your guys' reports, what you guys were digging up, uh, and also 
seeing that police weren't really talking at all. As you guys mentioned, it was hard to get them to speak. And um, the the series of events, they, they talked about the kids missing. And then I think the next day they released photos of Chad and Lori saying they were persons of interest. And then everybody watching, all of you viewers out there, you web sleuths that are messaging us nonstop about they're in Hawaii, they're this, they're that, they're that. People outside of here were doing their own investigating that's when you realized how how is this all all tied together? Uh, so I would say by beginning of January is when things started to really uh, come together as as far as realizing that this isn't a story that's going to be over in a week or two. Yeah, and the big and key that, term that first press release. Sorry, sorry, Justin. I was no. just going to say that first press release it came out months after the kids were last seen. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that there were so many whispers, it sounds like for weeks leading up to that press release in December, for months leading up to that press release in December, I mean, it sounds like everybody who really knew this family weren't in Rexburg, they were down in Springville. And, and those people down in Springville didn't know JJ or Tylee, they just knew um, Chad and his wife because that's where they spent most of their time. So um, Justin, I, before we go further, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, do you remember I mean, months before any of this, do you remember the way you guys covered uh, the Charles Vallow shooting? And, and I mean, I don't know if you were the reporter on that or, or to what extent yeah. you covered it, but it sure came in pretty clutch that you you guys had at least, I think you guys had sent a helicopter and I think you guys did at least a little something that, you know, months later turned out to be a lot more, um, you know, newsworthy than we initially expected. And, and that does happen here. Uh more than we think when there's a shooting that we can't physically get to where you send the chopper and then maybe like a, a solo photographer goes and really at that point it just looked like um report to be a, a shooting that stemmed from a fight domestic violence issue and someone claiming self-defense now we know that to be alex cox so really we only had some bullet points and no one really went further into it and requested body cam footage and right so we had not known the valo name until this missing persons report came out to look back at the charles valo shooting and then request everything that we did to just see what we could uh get so really uh it wasn't covered extensively when it was a shooting initially and and now we know kind of how this all stems back to charles valo and then back to we'll get into the divorce paperwork in January and February 2019, how much uh, background there is to this. But Adam, to follow up with you, like we teamed up right away on this December 22nd, trying to get interviews lined up because we had all seen the, the Woodcocks Facebook post and Brandon Boudreaux and the Woodcocks JJ's grandma that, and, and Brandon, which is the, uh, who is the ex-husband of Lori Vallow's niece, they really spearheaded this investigation. I think we can all agree in like sounding the alarm on this case. And I remember talking to Brandon that morning of December 22nd and just how he felt and kind of his, his mood. But Adam, you got to sit down with him for at least an hour in Utah. He has not been out there in the limelight like that. He has not been out there doing interviews. Just describe what you notice about his state of mind that day. Yeah, I mean, that was an interesting um, few hours leading up to that interview because you and I were both on the phone with him and neither of neither of us really knew where he was. I mean, he was legitimately in hiding because he was so worried about, you know, the attempt on his life um, and, and all these other aspects of the case that he knew a lot more about than, than either you or I did at the time. So I think I was talking to him and then you were talking to him. And at some point, it must have been like, what, half an hour, an hour into the, the conversations that we had with him, he kind of said, by the way, like, I'm not going to tell you exactly where I am, but I'm in Utah. And we were like, wait, what? Because obviously, you know, all, all this happened to him in Arizona. So that's when you and I got together and we were like, okay, I'm going to shoot this interview in Utah. He's going to come to our station. Um, and, you know, I, it was like an hour, hour and a half long interview. And at that point, it must have been like five, six o'clock. We were both getting ready for our late newscasts. And I remember trying to feed you as much as I can uh, before, you know, it, it could take, you know, for an hour, hour and a half long interview, it could take an hour, hour and a half long to just send it to you, much less be able to listen to it all. So you and I were on the phone trying to, to you know, take the relevant points. And I don't think we've ever actually uploaded that full interview. That's probably something we could do at, at some point. He was legitimately, he was scared. Like you could see it on his face. 
Yeah, he was terrified for sure. And there were a lot of, one of the reasons we haven't posted that full interview online is there was a lot of stopping and starting during that interview where, you know, we would chit chat for five, 10, 15 minutes. And then he would say, well, I can answer that question, but I'm not going to do it on the record. So we would turn off the camera. We would talk off the record for a couple minutes and then we'd go back on. So it's one of those things where um, we're finding out so much information about this family just, just through one person's perspective. And then it's a matter of, okay, now how do we get everybody else's perspective and how did they all fit together? So I, I think that was probably the first big on-camera interview that any of us have had throughout any of this case. And then obviously um, the, the Valo, um, the, the, the Woodcocks, the grandparents um, started going on camera quite a bit after that. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned Adam, or I mean, um, Brandon going off the record and talking to you on background. And, and I know you guys are familiar with this. So many people associated with the story have been talking off the record. You know, you, you, you hear so much more that you can't report or they don't want you to report just yet. And eventually it makes sense. And there's so many family members and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and parents that have been affected by this that this has been so traumatic for them, understandably. And, and maybe there is a reason why they haven't come forth publicly and maybe they never will. And that's one of the things that's been eye-opening to me is just learning some context around this. I mean, these are real human lives here that have been affected by these uh, acts, decisions. And, and man, there's so many stories behind the scenes that maybe one day they'll all come out. Uh, and that's, I, I don't know if this has been the truth for you guys, but in the beginning, once the news started to come out, getting bombarded with social media messages. And I mentioned the web sleuths earlier, but some of, some of the web sleuths are crazy. Like no offense to you guys, but, but the, the, the theories that people come up with, some are legit, but some are just out there. And, and with this particular story, you can go down so many different rabbit holes that mm -hmm. you gets all messed up in your mind. And I had to turn off my messages on Facebook because we were getting so many and, and you'd hate to turn them off because what if the one is the one, the one big, mm -hmm. big scoop, but uh, that that's been a whole separate animal. And Justin, maybe you want to get into this, the social media angle of all of this uh, people all over the world showing interest in this and, and trying to give us tips and information, which is very helpful, but some of them aren't so helpful. Definitely. Uh, there's a paranoia. I don't know how you could, turn off your Facebook messages. I, I understand they probably got, you know, just overwhelming and you're a dad. I just don't know how you juggle it all. But like, that's what I also wanted to talk about is this tips. There's so many tips that come in. And then for us sifting through what is valid and what is solid and what is just totally, what doesn't make sense at all. It, and we want to have an open mind and give oh, every tip a chance. And sometimes it, it's a waste of time, but like you said, you never know what could be the one, but I, yeah, I, I just, feel like you know we and i'm sure we do it just due diligence and, and giving that person a chance but also trying to like make sure it's uh it's legitimate but that's that's just that's this is our job we've been doing for a long time but in this case it was just like multiplied right um so yeah that was definitely something that was different about this compared to just you know any other story and when people are, are calling us saying that the Daily Mail sent a reporter and a photographer from England to Rexburg, you know there's something here. And when the Daily Mail has this as their main story, uh, yeah, that that's elevated the story, the national attention as well to it. Do you remember that there was a, an alleged sighting of Tylee like in the Midwest somewhere? at like a concert. I remember that tip came in. I spent so yeah. many hours trying to figure had, that out and talk to those people and making calls. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know, people followed it. 14 hours later, you realize, okay, this is not legit. And yeah, I don't think any of us, did any of us go with that? I don't think any- I, uh, I, I, I didn't, I've, I've seen I know it. And I, I've got, we got tips where, where someone may have seen them at a motel, Tylee and JJ, you know, two kids that look like them at a motel. and. Of course, you know, you freak out when you hear something like that and you, you, you go to that place and you try to talk to a manager, you try to get surveillance video, you, you become a detective. Uh, but it's just, uh, yeah, that, that aspect of it that you bring up, it has been wild. Now, I want to ask Eric, because Eric clearly is the youngest here. Uh, he, he's, you know, got into this industry real early and he, he's awesome. But just talk about how you approach this case from, from behind the scenes, really, and how you 
had to contribute right away and, and kind of like how you use your skill set, especially being so young in, in the industry. And it's one of those, like Nate said, he was sitting there in this concert and I'm at home researching all this. I mean, you can, you can do a lot with a Google search nowadays. I mean, you can find out a lot about people through a simple Google search and you can find previous places they've lived. You can look through social media and all that. And so, I mean, right off the gate that first night, I was diving in, looking through all of that. Um, and like you said, trying to piece together who is who, who's related to who here. And you could really go on to these rabbit holes and trying to piece together all these people that are involved. And it's really just searching their histories. I mean, knowing what happened. I mean, these people weren't very well known. I mean, before this. Um, and so it was a lot of looking where did they live before? And that's, I'm sure, Adam, that's when you found out that, oh, hey, they lived in Arizona before. So you contacted Justin. Um, and I think a little bit after that, Justin might have reached out to um, me, I think on Twitter or something at some point after that, during all this. And I mean, so then we just started all talking like, hey, we, we heard this and this and it's all over. And so, I mean, for me, it was just a lot of background research on who these people were, where they lived previous jobs, who they might have known um, so that we can just talk to those people. Because I mean, a lot of journalism is just talking with people around. Um, and then you do get those tips too, that you have to filter through. Um, it, it wouldn't even been a week since um, they announced that the kids were missing. They're looking for Chad and Lori. And I got some sort of message. I don't know who the person is. Um, it was some fake account um, you can you can tell when there's like a fake Facebook account and it had GPS coordinates like a latitude and longitude of them in Hawaii and I'm like what is th it's kind of was one of those like what is this and so I realized that Lori had lived with her previous husband Charles in Hawaii years ago and so I started calling up people that she was friends with on social media that lived in Hawaii and was like hey are they are they here um, and when those people didn't really want to talk, like they told me, I had some people tell me, please know everything that I know. And they left it at that. And so I think mm. for us, that was kind of one of those moments like, oh, they're there um, in Hawaii. And Nate and I talked a little more about that. And Nate talked with some of his sources. And so, I mean, it was a lot of that just talking with people and getting those tips and kind of chasing them down to see if they are legitimate. Yeah, you were sleuthing a lot away. more than just than just research. I mean, I remember during one of the search warrants at the Daybell home. I mean, we were on our way up there. I mean, it's it's a bit of a drive from Salt Lake City to Rexburg, and we're like, we need to get something on the air now. Like, Eric's there. Like, let's call him. Let's get him on the air and have him describe what's going on. So, I mean, you're a, not just a solid researcher. You're a solid boots on the ground reporter. And I think this partnership has been so um, successful amongst the four of us, and the fact that. Look, as much as, you know, this is a competitive industry and, you know, when you have a story that's this large, not just in the depth of facts, but also geographically, I mean, it's better to team up. It's better to, you know, do the story justice because like Nate described, these are real people. These are real kids that are missing. These are real families that are affected. And to, to say, you know, we want to be best and we want to, tackle this on our own and be independent and beat the competition it doesn't really do the story justice when you have somebody in arizona who could be knocking on doors in chandler and gilbert you have somebody in salt lake city who can drive down to springville and knock on those doors and of course you guys are at the center of it so um it, it's it's been an incredible incredible partnership so let's go into december into january you know even outside of these tip, these tips you were getting about Hawaii being a potential spot. Where, what, where did you guys think they could be? I mean, they weren't saying anything to law enforcement, obviously. They couldn't even get them to show the kids on FaceTime to cooperate at all, like one bit. Did you did you guys think Hawaii? I Because we had all these states involved. You had the FBI involved. They, they could have been anywhere at that time. Um, I thought, I wasn't sure until Eric came in and said, someone just sent us the GPS coordinates there in Hawaii. And then I contacted some of my police sources and said, 
I think we're going to go to Hawaii and track down Chad and Lori. And they didn't deny it. They weren't like, Hawaii? Why Hawaii? They're just like, why don't you wait? Wait a minute. <laughs> just hold up. Because we know what they're there and we don't want to spook them. We don't want them to take off. Um, so, and, and at that point, Dateline, had, we had entered an agreement with Dateline NBC to, to work with them and they were able to um, send somebody to Hawaii. So we kind of uh, knew what was happening. And, and, and so I think from the beginning, I thought, oh, they must be in Hawaii. I didn't, uh, for some reason, I never thought they were in Idaho. I thought that they had left and, and were maybe down in Utah or in Arizona before we got the Hawaii tip. I didn't think that they were here. Uh, and, and at one point, I think I may have even wondered if they were alive because they, the police had said they, mm -hmm. well, the police were careful in what they said. Obviously, they kind of knew where they were, but they, they didn't flat out say, we think that they're here. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I always thought they were. And Justin, didn't, didn't you kind of have a clue that they were in Hawaii too? I remember you sending us palm tree emojis. I did. Oh man. Yeah. That seems like so long ago. I know. I didn't even I remember, remember Justin, you and I were texting about that and we were sending each other addresses in Princeville. Yeah. And we're yeah. like, is this okay. a possibility that they're in Hawaii? And, and Nate, you know, I, I, obviously I don't have as good Idaho law enforcement sources as you do. But I was getting kind of the same non-answers. And I was like, they're probably in Hawaii. But that wasn't enough evidence for me to, you know, buy a plane ticket to go to Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was yeah. shocked when I saw you out there, not just in Hawaii, but in Hawaii with Lori, you know, mm -hmm. with, the, with the mic in her face and Eric running the camera. I mean, we when had an idea, but that hunch did not, <laughs> that hunch was not enough for us to, to, to hop on a plane and spend, you know, station money. But it's, uh, yeah. I imagine, a little easier when you're the news director, right, as opposed to uh, one of the reporters. Yeah, when I contacted Kauai police uh, the, and asked, it took a couple days to just get an answer, and the answer about them assisting Rexburg PD was basically, like, no comment. And then th that was the tip-off, like, okay, not saying anything. Most likely they're there. And then, like, uh, Eric talks about tracking down people who, who knew Lori and then you realize like this was really a, a safe haven for her she loved Kauai she 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 loved the island and she had spent so much time there and then it, it just made sense which leads us to the day January 26 2020 Nate and Eric take take us through how you found Chad and Lori physically right there in front of you and then just go through that you know infamous confrontation at Kauai Beach Resort we had landed late, late, late the night before. And uh, I think we got to the place where we were staying like at one in the morning. And um, a few hours later, we thought Justin might, we thought Justin that you might be there because you had texted us while we were about to board the flight, those, those palm trees. And uh, anyway, <laughs> excuse me, the, the Sunday, it was a Sunday morning, woke up and, um, you know, we called Rexburg police were obviously there. And we called them and said, so what's going on? And they said, don't, don't um, kind of lay low today on the island and uh, we'll let you know if anything happens. And then um, we laid low. Our camera broke on the flight. So our, we went to shoot some video and a stand up and stuff, but our camera wasn't working. So there's not a lot of places to buy a camera, a news camera on the island of Kauai. So we were debating, do we go to... Honolulu was it Eric where they there was, was a Best Buy was like every half hour there's a flight to Honolulu and yeah so, so we're like maybe we go in there fly, get a new camera we went to Costco uh and they had sold cameras but they didn't work with our microphones so anyway we ended up finding a guy who was willing to rent us a camera and uh we got the camera and we walked out to the car and we got a call that there was some police activity at the Kauai Beach Resort and we we uh drove there we were really close five minutes eric like five we're, minutes and we're we, on the same road as yeah we were like the right there and we see two Kauai police cars following this black suv into the resort and so we i'm like follow him and we recorded this whole thing and we pull in and get out of the car and there's lori vallow and i remember she was so skinny she was wearing like beach garb and she looked really mad um, big glasses and there was Chad and Chad was being put into a police car and Lori was in the other car and uh, one of the detectives was like stay back stay back and then we hung out there for 
30 minutes just video watching to see what was going on and more police arrived. And I remember, I'll never forget this image. Chad was in the one car and Lori was in another car and he looked out the window at her and like put his hand on the window, like, I love you, I, I miss you, I need you. You know, one of those kind of uh, weird type things. I, I took a picture of it um, and and uh, the we didn't know what was gonna happen by the way. We didn't know if they were gonna get arrested. We didn't know what was going on. We just knew that Chad and Lori were there. In the police still weren't telling us at that point what was happening. And finally, the officer, one of the officers came over and said, um, we are going to tow that car and we're going to leave. And I said, you're not arresting them? And he said, no. And I said, so once their car's done, are you guys done? He said, we're done here. I said, so you're gonna let them go. Can we talk to them? And he goes, well, you can do what, whatever you want, but we're leaving. So that's when I'm thinking, well, where are they gonna go? Their car's gonna be gone. They could call a taxi or an Uber, but that's gonna take some time. This is perfect for us. <laughs> like we can go talk to them because what I was hoping is that they'd say, oh yeah, we'll sit down and do an interview with you. And then we would have had a nice cordial interview. That was my hope. Uh, but obviously that's not what happened. And we didn't know where they were going to go. We didn't know how it was going to go. My only prayer is that Eric was able to get that camera rolling because it was a brand new camera and that the mic was working. And, and luckily Dateline was there with a few cameras too, but it all happened so fast and we just kind of followed them. And once they ducked into the back door of that hotel, we thought, should we go in? Well, we probably, they're probably not going to say much more. Should we wait? We ended up waiting there at like for an, a couple hours, Eric, to we'll see if they were going to come out. And then it was, well, we better get this video out. And so uh, we went back to where we were staying and the internet was horrible to upload that thing. It probably took two hours. Anyway, so many backstories there. And then um, kind of blew up. Did you, did you expect to see at some point the kids come out of the car or you know, maybe they're in there, maybe they're back there behind all this police tape? Or at that point, was it just, I see Chad, I see Lori, I assume, you'd probably never seen them in person before no. until that moment. No, I, and, and I was shocked at- I, I can imagine you trying to look over and see, are there kids here? Yeah, I, I wish I could say I was hoping the kid, I, we, that we'd see the kids. I, I would have been more shocked had the kids been there. What was equally as shocking is how Chad looked because we had just seen the one like driver's license photo of him he had lost weight, his hair was different, he was in beach shorts, he was in a t-shirt. And from what everyone had told us, Chad never wore shorts. He was always in pants and always in a short sleeve dress shirt. And so he he didn't really even look like Chad. His whole me. style had changed. Since oh yeah, was, right. yeah, you're right. And so that that was like, whoa, that's Chad. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wish you could say, I, I wish the kids would have been there, Adam, obviously everybody does. Uh, and you know, all this happened on the fly. I look back at that thing and I wish I would have asked different questions. Uh, I didn't notice the bag of money until the end. And now we know what was in that bag when they released what it was. And, and from what I understand, they weren't going to approach Chad and Lori that day. They were going to do it early the next morning at their house when it would have been dark and it would have not been as good for us because there would have been a knock on the door and they would have shut the door. So it actually... Uh, for our benefit as far as letting the world see them turned out good that it happened the day before. Justin, I remember talking to you maybe a week or two before this happened and you and I were on the phone with the Fox affiliate in Honolulu and we were saying, look, we don't know when this is going to happen. We don't know what's going to go down, but let us fill you in on this story. I think you and I took turns talking to this Fox affiliate in Honolulu. We kept telling we're them. <laughs> and we kept telling them, like, this is a big story. You guys are going to be interested. There's a Hawaii tie. There's a Utah tie. There's an Arizona tie. There's an Idaho. Uh, did I say Idaho already? Anyway, like, can you guys please be on standby? And their response was, well, you know, it's kind of a long flight for us. And it's not super easy yeah. from that island to Kauai. And then we see, well, it, you know, a couple of weeks later, it's like, well, it's a much harder flight from Idaho to Hawaii. <laughs> but, and but they, we they, also... You know, like I said, we didn't know what we what was going to happen. We 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 took the gamble that we could have gone out there and nothing would have happened. And and we we booked the flight for was it Saturday, Eric, to Tuesday. It was short. It was like a three day window because I had to get back for another story at the Capitol of, in Idaho. And so it was like, oh, we hope 
something happens and and it we couldn't have planned it uh, any better. Although the, the night we went to the airport the next night, we got word that Chad and Lori had checked into that other resort. And so we're like, oh, we're leaving. We wish we had another week to just kind of follow them around. And and anyway. Trust me, I wanted I wanted to be there. Um, but I, I was just I was just lucky to to receive the news and confirm that it had happened. But not knowing that you guys had had this video, I'm sure at that point you were just trying to get a sighting of them, but you really got to confront her. And like you said, she's very upset. Lori being, you know, her body language compared to all the body cam footage we've seen of her with law enforcement in the past, just the whole mood is different because now she, she's a person of interest at this point and her kids obviously not with her. Only some of the crucial belongings found like JJ and Tylee's birth certificates, JJ's iPads, what Tylee's uh, bank card found in that, in that rental car from that search warrant. Um, and with, I wanted to ask with their interaction with you guys, at, at what point did you feel something bad has really happened? If they couldn't say, hey, let's give you our side of the story. This is all overblown. You know, I, I still at that point, although the kids weren't with them, I still thought that they might be alive somewhere. And, and I still hoped that they would talk to us and say something. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of changed. It also changed my thought uh, that Lori kind of seemed to be the one in, in charge, if that makes sense, because she was definitely, she had grabbed Chad's hand mm -hmm. and was not leading him, but they, she was kind of you know, leading the way into that, that hotel. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I thought it was unusual that, and then I thought it was unusual that they showed up to church a few days later as if nothing was wrong. And we had, then I'm with you guys, I'm sure it turned into Chad and Lori watch. We had people from Hawaii taking photos of them at mm -hmm. Costco and at the gas station and, and hopping a flight to go to uh, Maui. I Maui, think. yeah. Yeah. And then coming back and at the bank it, it, for, for every day, it was like, what are they doing today? And we get these messages. And, and then we had come back by the time they were arrested a, a few days later, but by, by the time Lori was arrested and that was a whole nother day, we had tabloid photographers calling us. They're the ones that actually told us Lori was just arrested and I have photos to prove it and pay up if you want to see, well, we don't pay for photos. You guys don't pay for photos mm -hmm. or interviews or video. Um, and so it's like, wait, what? And that was a whole nother day where things blew up and we weren't over in Hawaii, we were here, but yeah. Um, I, I, but back to your original question, Justin, I still wanted to kind of give the benefit of the doubt that the kids were okay and maybe they just really were following their religious beliefs and they, they had put them away in a bunker waiting for you know, something to happen. Well, and especially because her answer, you know, the one kind of real answer she gave you as you're following her with that microphone is I think your question was something to the effect of, look, the whole world is praying for your kids right now. What do you have? Do you have anything to say about that? Can you give any sort of answer? And all she said was something to the effect of, oh, that's nice. I mean, just yeah. so totally nonchalant. And you just have to imagine, you know, especially you as a dad, I mean, you, there's no way, if your kids are in danger, there's no way you could act that nonchalant about the situation by simply saying, oh, that's nice and walking away so yeah eric i have a question for you like let's go into next week she doesn't comply Lori does not comply with the court order right it was january 30th produce the kids to rexburg police or the department of was a health department of health i believe either one and everyone's starting to pick up on the story and people are, and i'm sure you're on the ground waiting is there a chance she doesn't show up was there a surprise? Is that something that you assumed, you know, based on your interaction, based on what you saw in Kauai, that she wasn't going to show? I mean, it was one of those you never knew. It's like, we didn't know, did they book a flight back to Idaho? Would someone show up? And again, I mean, that day was Chad and Lori watch day kind of a thing. I mean, I lived in Rexburg at the time and was driving around and Nate came up that day too. And I mean, there was people, have she shown up yet? Have, have they shown up yet? I mean, there was two places they could have taken those children. And I mean, it was one of those media was swarming around the town that day. Um, people from Salt Lake, Arizona had all driven up that day. 
Um, I think the Woodcocks had come up around that time as well. And it was just one of those days of kind of just bizarre feeling for Rexburg um, that it, there was always that hope. I mean, that the kids would show up. Um, I think throughout all of this, I mean, there was that hope that the kids could be found. Um, even when Lori had been arrested with what the charges were, there was that hope that the kids would mm -hmm. be found. And so, I mean, throughout the whole thing, it was just, for me, it was just hoping that they'd find them and that it wouldn't turn into where we are today. Yeah. Adam, they didn't um, comply with that court order. She still wasn't arrested after the fact. I remember uh, my colleague, Lauren Steinbrecher and I, we were putting together a, a half hour special that ran, um, it was either January 30th or January 31st. And we were thinking, you know what, like we've pre-produced this half hour special that honors the kids and tells as many sides of the story as we could possibly contain. Um, and we may have to blow this whole thing up if there's an arrest or they bring the kids or something. And, you know, the, the deadline hit and nothing happened. It was just this big anticlimactic moment where they set a hard deadline and still nothing happened. And, you know, we, we put the story on the air and obviously, uh, you know, I think all four of us have been interviewed now on specials that, you know, Dateline has put together and, and you know, documentaries. And um, it's, it's a story that, has gotten so much national attention. And yet here we are at the beginning, you know, it's as close to day one as possible. And, and we're trying to find answers that are still not being given to us by Lori and Chad, in your case, Nate, by the police and all of our case, because this is a case that they had to keep so close to the best. Mm -hmm. And Adam, I also want to ask about Chad Daybell, because like, just like Lori's roots are here in Arizona, a lot of history here. You did a lot of background research on Chad. Uh, you know, he lived in Springville. He dug graves there for a living at, at one point, but you, you took it further. You, you read his books, at least one of them that I know of. I, how did that help you in any way, like learn more about his thinking possibly? Yeah, we weren't sure what we would find, but um, we, we, I was talking to one of my law enforcement sources in Utah who said, look, Here's one of the things the FBI, I can guarantee you, is doing. They're reading his books because if we're going to put together a profile on this guy, there may be clues somewhere in there. I never had heard of him before this case. So I went to uh, the local LDS bookstore and I found out we don't sell Chad Davos books. And I wasn't sure why necessarily. I, I don't know how that process worked. So I had to go find like a thrift store that sold his books. I bought his autobiography and I bought um, his first publication. And I just sat down, took a day or two, got out my highlighter. And there are so many interesting things that, you know, are circumstantial, but you could draw from those books, you know, weird characters. He names uh, characters after people in his family. There's nothing in there about, you know, remarrying or losing his wife or anything like that. In fact, on the front page, it was a dedication to his wife, Tammy. I mean, they were clearly very in love, at least at, at some point in their relationship, maybe until the end, I don't know. Um, but we said, look, we're gonna kind of take a page out of the investigator's book and, and read these Daybell books and put together a story that shows all the clues that might have something to do with this case. And I think it was an interesting story. And um, you know, I, I'm sure there's probably even more clues if you had the time to read through his 20 plus books. Um, because my understanding is they got you know, more and more radical as, as time went on. Well, was there a common theme with denominator here and in, in what he was writing about? I mean, obviously we know he writes about, you know, doomsday events and he, he, he claims to have had visions and near death experiences, but what, what stood out? The thing that was most interesting to me is that I think in order to get his books published, he had to say that they were fiction. But then as time went on, it became more and more clear that in Chad Daybell's mind, this was not fiction. These were real prophecies that he received from God in his mind that he believed were actually going to happen. You know, floods, fires, earthquakes, China and Russia invading the United States. I mean, it's this very vivid story that he puts together that he marketed as fiction, probably to remain in good standing with the church. But then he goes on later to say, this is, this is not fictional. And that's obviously a, a red flag and something that I'm sure investigators uh, looked at and 
who knows if it'll be part of uh, the, the upcoming trials. And we knew Chad and Lori believed in the end of the world based on what sources friends had to say, uh, based on like the books that you spoke of, what kind of the basis of their beliefs. It's, it's not uncommon. People believe in um, the end of times, but really the divorce papers filed by Charles Vallow, I remember it was when we broke that January 3rd, 2020, that shed light on the alleged threats and what Lori was allegedly saying, being a God, a translated being, permission. And when we were all looking at these documents, I'd like to know, you know, what was your reaction seeing this filed in court, these, these allegations that do not appear to be reality. We've read dozens and hundreds, I'd say, court documents and an allegation. Just what were your thoughts of seeing what Charles was saying? My first reaction was, Justin, you got to send me that paperwork from Arizona because that's <laughs> some bizarre stuff. And Nate, you talked about how, you know, these web sleuths have these crazy ideas and theories. And, you know, as many crazy and unfounded tips as we received, we also find out some of them are legit and there had been something floating around for a couple weeks about zombies and these super bizarre religious beliefs that I had never heard of. And I was like, yeah, how in the world do I prove that? And here's Justin Lum in Arizona finding some court documents that, that show, <laughs> yeah, this is very much, uh, this is very much something they believe in. Justin, I'd love to hear what you thought. You uncovered it. You saw it first. I mean, what were yeah. you I didn't believe it. I mean, it was uh, reading about, you know, this is the first time that we're seeing these terms, right? Uh, Charles saying that he he was Nick Schneider to, to Lori and that who, who is Nick Schneider, first of all, and how she would have an angel to dispose of his body. Like, you look at Lori and you think, how could this, this normal looking mom be, be saying these things so I was just I was just in shock and just like reading it through like like how do we have to attribute every allegation to this paperwork like we have to just you know make sure all our bases are covered because the people that are hearing this for the first time we, we had some inkling we had some background that she, she allegedly believed in, in these type of things but seeing it I mean filed by a lawyer it, it proved some legitimacy and then Later on, we find out through body camera video that Charles was basically pleading to law enforcement, whether it's Gilbert or Chandler, and he was saying these things into to officers in that moment. They probably had to think that Charles was uh, acting very strange. But yeah, to, to answer that question, it, it, it was just shock. And I didn't understand the moment that we were going through the documents, how it would really like take this even more national than it was. But yeah, that was, I will, I'll never forget reading that for the first time. Well, and then you pointed out, I mean, you, you have the body camera footage from those days when he was talking to police, but then on that same day or day after, Lori walks into a, the police station, and I mean, she seemed very normal uh, when you walked through that. I mean, it didn't seem like this lady that was going on this religious rants that Charles was saying. So, I mean, the whole thing was just, I think, bizarre too, when you hear the, hear what Charles was saying in these court documents, but then also see when she was talking to police those same days. I mean, just the whole thing just seems so bizarre and out there. Um, it was, I think, hard to just comprehend all of these things that were being said. It was hard to digest for me because I'm not familiar, I was not familiar with with the church and, and, and these terms, like the 144,000, like her saying that she would lead 144,000 to the new Jerusalem and she's married to the prophet Moroni. Uh, I had to do my background research to just find out like who these people were, who these figures were. And um, Justin, I am familiar with the church and I had to do my background <laughs> research to find out what the heck this was talking about because yeah like wait what who, who who did what so i can't imagine someone that's not familiar with the church trying to put this all together and separate fact from fiction fiction and i know adam in in salt lake where a large portion of your viewership is latter-day saint you want to be respectful to the church mm -hmm. and the members but you also 
need to tell the story. And, and that's, you know, something we've tried to do, respect the church and differentiate the extreme, crazy fringe stuff that's not taught versus normal beliefs that Chad and Lori apparently were not in line with. Yeah, I, I spent probably a couple hours talking to our main anchor at the station, who's, you know, a long practicing Latter-day Saint. And I said, okay, I need to give you I need you to give me as, as simple as possible a history lesson, and I need you to help me separate what are normal beliefs, what are maybe more fringe beliefs, and what are the more, you know, what are the just downright radical beliefs that we are finding here? Because without that context that, that you have, uh, Nate, growing up in the church, it's, it's hard to know exactly what parts of this story are out there. Obviously, an angel disposing of my husband's body I was pretty sure right away that's not a uh, standard teaching uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I mean, 144,000, you know, I had definitely heard of, of many of these names, you know, just being around uh, the church and since I moved to Salt Lake City. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a rabbit hole, but it's one that we have to go down respectfully uh, for the sake of not alienating a, a very normal religion. Um, you know, by, by comparison, you know, and we, we see some of these uh, comments on um, these internet message boards that try and lump in Chad and Lori with the rest of the church. And obviously we know that it's not the same thing. I mean, th there's, there's radical sects of every uh, religion. And um, assuming that everything we've reported about what Chad and Lori believe is true, they're, they're not practicing standard teachings. And then there was the financial aspect, you know, $35,000 drained from Charles's business account. And we started to dig into possible financial motivations with life insurance through this. So it's, it's, a, it's religion, money, um, this, this Back case. Marriage. All, yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and then now let's go to uh, back to Rexburg. Nate and Eric, you guys uncovered that surveillance video from Self Storage Plus showing Lori, Chad, Alex Cox sometimes, her brother, moving items into the unit. That was huge. And you found the kids' clothes, bikes, scooters, photo albums. But also the um, October 2nd, as they're moving stuff in, and this is, wasn't the clearest video at the same, things are happening in multiple states simultaneously. October 2nd, Brandon Boudreaux is shot at by someone driving a Jeep registered to Charles Fallow. And so you're investigating this storage unit, but you're also looking at what's going on in Gilbert, how you tie it together and then figure out who's who in the video and what stood out about those, those items. It's yeah, a lot. That, that I got to give credits to the owner of that facility. He, or the storage uh, facility, he called on a Sunday and said, I, um, I have this video, do you want it? And it's like every reporter's dream, like what? But I wasn't, I was kind of holding my breath until we got there to see it. Cause sometimes, you know, it, it's not what it is but we got there and sure enough. And then he said, well, you want to go see the unit? And I remember how eerie it was when he opened the door and there's their belongings, like photos too, like real jerseys and, and real sentimental stuff. This wasn't like, you know, old, clothes it was uh, blankets with their photos and things like that and um yeah that that was crazy the fact that she had left all that and that she had defaulted on paying the the bill and so it wasn't like she wanted it or, or, and they had tried multiple times to get a hold of her legally at that point he could have taken all that stuff and auctioned it off he didn't and the police now have it um and i i remember uh we put up that story and I didn't think it would be such a big thing. I mean, I knew it was a big deal, but I re remember uh, within, uh, he said within an hour, every media organization had called, had called him at the storage unit. And, and then you mentioned the timeline, Justin, at that point, I'm not quite sure if we knew all the other things about what was going on everywhere else. I think once we got the timeline of what was happening at the storage unit and how they were coming and going, then we were able to say, Oh, wait, at this time that was happening in Arizona and this was going on. And they took out the car seat. It appeared to be the car seat and put the car seat back and the tire off the G things like that. It, it, it helped kind of piece it all together. Yeah. Um, back to Brandon, because of that shooting, 
you know, that bullet missed him by inches. And he had that photo of his Tesla uh, shot The really, that's what we were looking for in court. And through his case, his uh, family court case, that's how we found the Charles Vallow divorce paperwork. So it just shows you how news gathering can work and how something you're looking for, uh, you end up finding something even, even bigger. Um, but yeah, the timeline is twisted. And, and I want to make sure that we cover Tammy Daybell's death here, because that's still under investigation. October 19, 2019, she dies in her home in, in Salem. And um, Daybell family does not request an autopsy. Uh, body has been exhumed, we know that. And we're still waiting for results that we may never see for who knows how long. Um, and so Chad and Laura are being looked into for conspiracy, murder, or attempted murder. Had you guys heard of the Daybells in Idaho before that? I know you said you never heard of Chad, but it seems like everyone knows each other somehow there. It's a, it's a tight-knit community, you know, and just take me through how you found out about her body being exhumed. Or did that just come out when, when the kids were reported missing officially to the public? I had heard the beginning of December, like the, the first or second, it was real early on, I got a, a text message from a friend who said, um, I'm hearing that there's something more to Tammy Daybell's death. And I didn't know who Tammy Daybell was. And I went online and looked up her obituary and thought, oh, she, she was young. Um, and then I, I didn't think much more of it. Uh, I, I may have reached out to like the, the PR person, the PIO for the department and and didn't really get an answer. But Eric had, we get these police logs, I'm sure you guys do from the agencies of, of all the calls that come in. That's a public record that you can get. And Eric spotted something even before that about the shooting yeah. in Arizona. Well, I mean, the whole thing was just, because I remember when Tammy had died, because I, I lived in the community and um, I was at the time a college student there. And uh, Chad's kids were going to school there and some in the same department as me. And I remember when Tammy died. I mean, I remember there was the funeral. Um, and so it wasn't really, I mean, it was just a sad thing. People were sad, condolences and stuff. Um, but then back to where Nate was saying in that, in that log, there was an entry in there. It was something about a homicide investigation, a missing seven-year-old kid and a search warrant being served on a townhome on Pioneer Road. And everybody I talked to, and I was like, well, we don't know what this is. And it, it was just weird. I mean, I called Arizona authorities and when I, I read them what the log said and they're like, we don't even know what this is. Um, there was a phone number attached to it and that phone number didn't come back to anybody. I called it, it was disconnected. Um, so there was little things that were getting fed to us during that whole time, but nothing really publicly I mean again this is one of those where Nate said the community wasn't really talking much about about it I mean the kids had been living in Rexburg what a few weeks before they disappeared um, and so I think the whole thing nobody really knew much about this to really because a lot of times with news stories I'm sure you guys all know you get tips from people oh, something's going on at the corner here um, and so this was one of those that we heard little things but really information wasn't coming out because as we know they're investigating something a lot bigger and we're trying to keep that under wraps well eric it seems like in that community there i mean tammy was so popular she had so many friends she was such a kind soul she was helpful i mean she just had this it sounds like incredibly charismatic personality and when somebody just dies suddenly in their sleep obviously people are shocked and concerned and have questions and they ask Chad and they're not really getting answers. And it sounds like very early on, people thought something was funny, but it wasn't really until months into the investigation that friends and family members of Tammy started to feel more comfortable and confident raising some of those questions and concerns that they had months prior. Because, you know, to think something is one thing, to say it out loud is something else. And at that time, I'm sure they wanted to be respectful to Chad and to the kids who, you know, were, from their perspective, going through a difficult time with the loss of their family member. And it, they're not going to be comfortable at that point to 
to question family members, to, to accuse somebody of foul play. And, you know, I, I'm curious to get all three of your perspectives on this. Have you ever seen an autopsy take this long, more than a year? I mean, it's, it's incredible that either A, they're, they have some results and they're holding it incredibly close to the vest on what exactly happened to her, or B, they still can't find exactly what happened. Adam, Tammy's family's in Utah. You know, you did some digging there and, and talk, talk to them off camera, I believe, and she had visited. So yeah, that just shows again how all these states, how these, uh, des these locations are tied together. Let's talk about your insight on that. Yeah, I mean, Tammy's family, they love her. And they were very close to Chad at many points throughout the, the process leading up to her death. So, so many of them have different perspectives. Um, and, you know, none of them have done an on-camera interview since the beginning of this. They've released statements throughout the way and they've asked for privacy, which we've honored. I mean, it's an incredibly difficult thing to not just lose a family member, but to lose, you know, I mean, Chad Daybell was also considered a family member. Their, their kids were family members. And in many ways, they've, they felt like they've, they've lost, um, you know, the, the, the kids as well. So um, it, it's, it's just a tough situation. And as reporters, obviously the story is important, but the fact that these are human beings with feelings and emotions and ties to the story far more than we do or any viewer would comes first. And I can remember through this whole year, there's been just like, it's been a roller coaster. There's been weeks where it's been real quiet. And then all of a sudden there's just like, everything's happening and we're just, all running around just trying to get all the information we can and I remember like it was yesterday February 20th that was the day of Lori's arrest in Kauai where we all we all remember and just like that buzz in the newsroom like finally something was happening that you know law enforcement had something on her and it was the child desertion charges um, but then it's the extradition this I, I'd like to know I, I got I finally got to visit Rexburg, Idaho, and saw how it was at the courthouse. But like leading up to it, if you guys can just set the scene of the news of the arrest and then just that wait for Lori's return. She hadn't been there since November. Yeah, and uh, man, I, I've never seen anything like that at the courthouse, that, that first court hearing. You were there, Adam, weren't you? I know Justin was. I mean, Yeah, Justin and I were texting each other like, looking at every possible flight they could possibly be on. And you knew the whole time you were speaking at like a- Well, I, we, we, something, right? we thought we knew, we, we, we had a pretty solid tip, but we still weren't sure. And, and so um, it worked out perfectly. I remember the night before we had three quarters of the flight plan known and someone messaged me and said, think outside the box. And then I realized, oh, and that's when Eric tracked down that the, the state plane, the Idaho plane was, there was a flight from Boise to Rexburg. How often does the state plane land in Rexburg, Idaho? Yeah, that was something else. And I had heard that too, the day of that, hey, she's coming. Into, but the person that was telling me, like, I, like we talk about tips, like I just did, I'm new to this place. I don't know who I could believe. Yeah. You know, this, was a, this was a local, like this was just a, a resident here that said hey, she, I, she's coming into Rexburg. Yeah. But then when we saw that she had got off uh, Lennon in Boise, right? We yeah. thought that they should just be driven there. And all of a sudden she comes on this like private plane. It was crazy. They yeah. clearly took a very, very indirect, complicated route oh. from Kauai to Rexburg. Yeah. Really yeah. And, and, you know, it, it worked to an extent, but there were still, you know, paparazzi in, in LA and, and, you know, just the whole way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and so she was taken to the jail, and I remember uh, we were over at the jail. Eric was at the jail most of the day, and then um, I, the the long wait for her to walk from the one building to the other, which ended up not even happening. They, they drove her across. Um, and then the court hearing the next day, which was just unbelievable, the amount of people that showed up to be in that hearing, and then afterwards they were waiting for chad to leave remember and everybody's running from one door to the other to the other and chad went out the back and um it was a chaotic scene that that's, I, the, the, I mean you, you picture in los angeles or something not rexburg idaho 
And I've covered I a lot of we had both sides of that gate surrounded. I mean, there was a media scrum on one side and a media scrum on the other. And I remember Eric, I mean, I was like kind of just bouncing around between both sides. I mean, we were waiting for so long. I was just restless. And I remember Eric and I were on one side at one point and Mark Means walks through the front door, which was kind of like the first sign that, okay, maybe there's going to be some movement here. Maybe there's going to be some progress. And I remember Eric and I like looking through the window of, you know, a public building and I can kind of hear him say like the word Mark Means because I don't know what this guy looks like yet. I mean, he had just kind of gotten onto the case and, um, Eric and I are like, wait, was that him? Like, did, did you hear him say that? And, you know, I think we have cell phone video and boy, we didn't realize at the time how much of a, a character and big part of the case he would be because remember at the time, I mean, they were bouncing around between quite a few lawyers. So it seems like Mark Means is the one that has stuck at least for in Lori's case. Hmm. I think those days are just going to be unforgettable there. Cause I mean, I've covered a lot of hearings at that courthouse and it's not uncommon to for it to be me the attorneys and the defendant i mean that's how small i mean people don't usually go to, to hearings there at that court courthouse and so i think it just the frenzy of all that i mean just really put it into perspective of how big the reach has gotten especially with the pandemic we may not ever see a scene like that at the madison county courthouse for years to come it, that's something that I'm, I'm sure, like you guys said, it stands out as something that you won't forget. Um, and, and we're almost near the end of this timeline, but Chad returned to Idaho before Lori got extradited back. So I'm sure there was there was Chad watch. I'd seen some pictures of whenever he was out and about people would show Chad walking around around the town. But at this point, we still had no idea about the whereabouts of JJ and Tylee. Um, but knowing what we know now, th this means for some of the time from uh, March to June, Chad was in his home comfortably, you know, sleeping there each night, going about his life when the children's remains were in his backyard the whole time. This, for you guys, your reaction to learning and like realizing that that was a situation pretty much all along and just like how unthinkable that is really. I, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, it just is unbelievable. I remember that day when they served that warrant, June 9th, these days stick out. I didn't know we'd know news so quickly, but it seemed like they were in the backyard and then within an hour or two, Chad's in custody because you know how slow things have moved with this case. And here we are, whoa, they're serving the warrant. They've shut down the block. Whoa, Chad's been arrested. And then they found remains like that fast it happened so quick and then that night they held that news conference where they confirmed it was two sets of remains they didn't say children but but one could assume i think it was just an unbelievable one a big sigh of relief that they had had some closure on where the kids were but two in his backyard in, in his yard and in the manner in which they were disposed of i i don't i don't know if i can ha have any comment on that it's just so unbelievable um but i'm just glad that they were found because you know how many how many cases have we covered over the years where there's we still don't know where these missing children or missing people are can you tell the story about how you got up there in the in the, the helicopter, helicopter yeah. yeah i mean everyone wants to know the behind the scenes helicopter story because that's how i found about that's how i found out about what was going on that day i woke up i see nate in a chopper i say <laughs> east idaho news has a chopper like, what in the world is going on like that was nice. search warrant but they've done a lot of search warrants before it, why is, does this one warrant a helicopter and you know it all came out very quick and very quickly i was in my car saying all right i'm gonna be going uh 90 miles per hour actually uh strike that we're on the record here we went at a very safe speed yes. uh, <laughs> up to uh rexburg as as quickly and as safely as we can as we could and uh I we, we realized this, this is, this is not just a normal search warrant. No. And, and I, I had been on a run that morning. It was around seven, seven 30 when somebody texted me and said, there's cops at Chad Daybell's house. I instantly called Eric because Eric at the time was living five, 10 minutes away. I said, get, get to his house, then started to call the police. And the, the first person I called said, this one is going to be very different. You can't get close. And I thought, what? And then Eric 
I told Eric, Eric was going to try to get as close as he could, but he couldn't get close. Just there was a police blocking the road and everything. So I got home from my run. I'm getting ready for work. And I'm like, maybe we could fly over the house. And so I, I made some calls and, and uh, was able to get a helicopter, you know, find a helicopter. And um, anyway, uh, there was not a do not fly zone. I worried that the police may have put a do not fly zone above the area and they hadn't. And so we, I think we're in the air at, got the call at 7.30, we were in the air around nine and um, started to go live, which I debated in my head, should we, should we go live? Now, remember, this isn't a news helicopter, so it's not equipped with cameras. You know, it's not real fancy, it's a helicopter. So our cameras were our phones and we did have a camera in the back, but it's hard to kind of stabilize that thing. So the, the footage was not the greatest, but uh, when we got over the house, I'm like, whoa, they're in the backyard. They're not in the house, they're in the yard and it's gridded. And there's dogs. And so you generally can assume what that means. And we stayed in the air about 20, 30 minutes and then came back. And then we heard that human remains were found. Someone actually called us and said, uh, off the record, they're bringing in a bulldozer in a minute. And uh, then we went back up a second time just to get other shots. So. Um, yeah, that was a, a crazy chain of events. Again, I didn't, I didn't think that it would be that big or that we would see what we saw. But once you see that they're in the backyard and there's cadaver dogs and that there was two areas they were focused on over by the tree and the pond and over by the fire pit, um, it was crazy. And Eric was on the ground trying to get information there on the scene while I was up in the air. And uh, yeah, that was a wild, wild day. Yeah, Eric, take me through those moments because, you know, you we know this by whenever we go to breaking news that you're never going to be right in front of it all. They're going to tape you off. They're going to create a large perimeter. Um, but did you see Chad drive off at some point, just kind of like how that developed for you on the ground? I mean, so the whole thing's weird because I mean, a lot of search warrants here, you can get right up. I mean, the January one, I was standing on the property line of the house. Um, but this time they had us back a mile in every direction from that house um, so I didn't, I didn't know really, I tried taking a camera and zooming in as far as I could to kind of try to see what was going on. Um, we had that, uh, Nate up there with the helicopter. So I'm watching that on my phone, just trying to see, get info. And then we got a message saying, Hey, there's a bunch of police cars down the road. Um, and that Chad had been taken into custody. So I'm a mile on the other side of the house. So I had to drive all the way around and when I pull up there I I see some of the officers and they're like yeah we just put, took him into custody and Chad had been already gone um, by that point because I mean he was within minutes and his car was just there um, and so I think that was kind of one of those moments you're like what did they find in the backyard that he was um, arrested that that quick. Nate I have a question about when you're up in that helicopter and I don't know if you've ever addressed this, but you know, I, I see people talking about it a lot in the comments as, as people look back on that day. I mean, you're on Facebook Live, not just recording what you see down there, but the Daybell, one of the Daybell kids is typing comments on during the Facebook Live and you're somewhat responding to that. What was that like? So um, that, there, there's a little bit, bit of miscommunication there, or uh, misinterpretation. Uh, I was, I was live like this, and I had a colleague behind me, and uh, one of the the in-laws of uh, Chad's son-in-law had said something to the effect of, I, I said something like, "Can you hear me?" to the audience because we were in a helicopter adjusting the mic, and some someone commented your sound is garbage, just like you're reporting uh, his, in, his son-in-law. And I said to him, oh, hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. And then I said to my colleague behind me, we'll be over the house in just a minute. But it sounded like I said, hi, Joe, we'll be over your house in just a minute. Um, I, I, and I didn't directly, I just said, I did address him in the video, but I was really talking to uh, Brittany, my colleague behind me saying, we'll be over the house in just a minute. 
I didn't really turn around. I may have slightly turned around. The next thing I knew that was a meme and that was the pull out from the video and everyone's talking to me about that. Um, I don't, I don't, I've, I think we may have spoken with their family a time or two and I don't, I don't have anything against them. I get that emotions and feelings are raw during this and, and sometimes people attack us for the reporting. I, and I, I can understand that to a point. And so I don't have any hard feelings toward him and would love to talk with him and, and any, anybody really um, at this point. So that, that's kind of where that came from. Funny to me that, that that's a lot, a lot of what people remember from that thing. I moved on and forgot about it till next thing I saw it was a meme on Twitter. And Nate, uh, just to follow up on that, that's a really touchy situation because you have taken, making, made this decision to get up in a helicopter over a site where human remains are being dug up. But at the moment, we're not sure yet. So you just take me through the, the reporting process on how you, you know, how responsible you have to be. I mean, you, you can never really prepare for this type of moment in your reporting career. I mean, I don't know if you've been in that situation before, but- No, nope, I haven't yeah. been in that. It's, uh, it's complicated. Yeah, and, and I told our pilot, I said, how low can we go legally? And I think he said 500 feet above the scene. And I said, let's not go that low. I, we stayed pretty high up. We could have gone a lot lower. And I had made the decision of when we, when we first got there, I had my camera, I didn't zoom in at all. I wanted to look and see if there was anything like, you know, if you're seeing bones come out of the ground, you don't want to have that live on, on Facebook. Um, and so it, it was pretty, I don't want to say innocent, but it was pretty typical police work at the beginning uh, when, we, when we started to go live. And we didn't hover. We didn't hover over the scene for hours. We, we could have legally, we have the right to, unless they file a no fly zone. Uh, but we went for 20, 30 minutes, give people an idea of what's happening. And then we left. And then we went back in the afternoon and we stayed. I think we may have gone a little lower, but um, you know, we're, we want to be respectful of the police and their investigative duty, but it's also our duty to report what's going on. And, and so that's why we went and did it. Um, you know, we, I guess we could have landed across the street if we wanted or something, but you know, it, it was just to kind of give people an idea and give us an idea of what was happening and and I think that uh, later that day, drones went up, different things like that went up to just to get a closer look at what was there. I, yeah. I know you, you've talked a lot about uh, through your reporting that as a dad, it, it, I'm sure it colors your perception on this story. I mean, this is a story about missing kids and you have older kids and Justin, you have a, you have a baby on the way, right? Yeah, Eric and Eric is a dad too. He has I didn't know that. Second on the way. So I, I guess my question for the three of you um, is, is how does that change the way you view the story and then report on the story, you know, because obviously we never inject ourselves into it, but that's got to, you know, it's hard not to see kids and, and think, you know, I, yeah. I have those two and I, I care and love for those two. Well, it, it definitely changed all, all reporting once I became a dad, because it, 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 you, you, you take this into account. Um, my daughter's birthday was June 8th. So the next morning is when they found the bodies. And so, uh, my parents had left that morning. They came to celebrate with us her birthday. And I just remember it was, and JJ's my daughter's age. And I remember such a juxtaposition to having cake and opening presents and having a party with my daughter who's turning seven. And the next day, 12 hours later, they're, they're announcing that human remains have been found. And it didn't really hit me. She asked, cause she was kind of following the story. We try not to, you know, let our kids watch the news, but she had been following it. She, and people were asking her about it. And she asked if she could go to a vigil for JJ and Tylee later in the week. And I wrestled with that because I don't want to mix work and family and everything. And I, I finally, after talking with my wife, I'm like, I, I guess she can come, but I didn't, I really didn't want to make it a thing, but she came and, um, I also wanted it to use it as a teaching moment too for her. So she was there and I, the, the organizer of the vigil was so kind to her and gave her a candle and a, a cup and I was there reporting and a photographer took a picture of her holding the candle from behind. And I remember that's like when it hit like, oh gosh, this is, this is, this is real. And um, she had many questions. Why, why were they in the backyard? Why, how, how did they die? And many questions that we all have. So 
yeah, it's it's definitely made it more real, especially going to those vigils and, and seeing it. And I imagine as the court proceedings come and they'll probably show some graphic photos and, and whatnot, that's when it'll it'll hit extra close to home. But yeah, that that's uh, that that's a personal aspect that you can't really leave out personally. This has been a really interesting uh, conversation and just to kind of just recap and um, speak to each other. I really just respect you guys' work through this whole thing. And I think it's just, um, this is something that's very rare that happens between journalists, but on a case like this, a lot a lot of it is just uncommon. So again, thank you guys it, so much. It so much proves time. the value of local reporting, in my opinion. I mean, that the fact that, and local newsrooms are struggling all over America, all over the world, and so, local reporters can do so much than not not discounting national news we need the national news organizations and they help a ton too but it's the local guys that can really we live here this is this is our community you guys live where you live and and you're going to be there for a while i imagine and uh so thanks to everybody that's followed the stories across all all the platforms